Welcome to the DeFi Standard, and this is Mickey B. Fresh, and I got with me Patty XRP. And today is an exciting day. We have our full de- first epoch of delegations to the FTSO signal providers, roughly 700 million, just under 700 million, has been wrapped and delegated to signal providers. So this is very exciting. This is what everyone talks about, utility of assets. Here's the utility taking place and on the decentralized Songbird time series Oracle. So Patty, uh, we're gonna run through some of the flaremetrics.io, which is a great resource to take a look at the different signal providers. And we're gonna go through some details here on how you know which signal providers are ideally suited for you to delegate to and why you should delegate to different ones based on the different statistics at that time. Yep, absolutely, Mickey. And to go over some of the numbers here, this is on their homepage. Currently, the circulating supply is 9.4 billion Songbird tokens, and these all belong to either XRP airdrop recipients or the Flare Limited team. And additionally, the foundation has 5.6 billion, but that should not be included in circulating supply at this time because they are not able to use it to participate in the network. The foundation isn't actually completely formed yet or anything like that. So these tokens won't be entering into the circulating supply for a little while until we hear about that. And just for a you know reminder with the foundation, they can only use the... 5.6 million Songbird as directed by us, the Spark token holders in the future when that gets formed. And so with that, they'll mainly be using it to spend on, you know, salaries for people that work for the foundation or, you know, uh, maybe we have them can condu- have uh, hire somebody to conduct analysis on the network or look into new applications that can be built or whatever, you know, these funds end up being used for. That's how they would eventually get into the circulating supply. Also, I mean, we could decide possibly to take some of the supply from the foundation and make rewards pools in the future. I mean, you know, it's open governance, you know, your mind's the limit, basically, whatever you can imagine. So that's how that will work. And then we can see for this first epoch period, which will last one week, and we'll kind of get into those timelines uh, here shortly, but there'll be 19.7 million Songbird rewarded over the course of the next week, and that's starting on Saturday. Additionally, uh, we can see, yeah, that they'll have some totals here for FTSO rewards total, so how many that have been given out, how many that have been claimed, and then how many that have expired. So this is a note here. If you receive Songbird rewards from the FTSO and you do not claim them for three months, then they will be forfeited. And I believe they will go into some kind of pool, Mickey, from what I was seeing, maybe on Songbird back into the foundation supply or possibly redistributed uh, through the FTSO. But we'll have to see what happens with these uh, forfeited ones and look for some more guidance from Flare. Now, how often are the rewards going to be distributed for users who delegate? How often will they be able to claim them? Yep. So that's a great question. You'll be able to do it once a week. And just so everybody knows, yesterday at around 1442 UTC time, the voting power for all the signal providers, or actually, sorry, today, Today. not yesterday. Yeah, I already thinking it's Friday. (laughs) Um, So that got locked in today, this morning on the East Coast for us. And what that means is any delegations that now happen will not be added to the voting power of the signal providers until a week from earlier today, basically. And at that point, they'll have new voting powers behind each of these signal providers. Now, the Flare metric site is going to track this as more people add it throughout the week, but just know that the voting power that happened earlier today is what will be locked in for an entire week. Rewards will start accruing on Saturday. I want to say pretty early in the day based on, I think it was eight o'clock UTC time. So like really early in the morning for people in the U S and with that, they'll start accruing for an entire week until the following Saturday, October 2nd, at which point you'll be able to claim the first set of rewards. Additionally, 
this also means that since this locked in period happened this morning, the next period before the next epoch will start will be next Thursday. And you'll need to either have changed any delegations that you would like to change by that time. Or you would also need to, let's say, if you get your songbird on Monday, then you would need to go ahead and wrap those and delegate them out by Thursday at that time, 1442 UTC. But with that, Mickey, I think it would make sense. You know, I wouldn't go and be changing if you already set up your delegations before we even see the data come in and see, you know, how successful some of these signal providers are. So, you know, you can wait until Wednesday to do that. And, you know, just to be safe and be like, okay, you know, maybe uh, Scandi nodes is the best one. And that's what you want to get into because yours wasn't doing that great. So that's just something to keep an eye on. Uh, Flare metrics will have success rates posted. So that'll be cool to see once they get those going. Yeah. So I just want to give a reminder to everyone when you're delegating to the signal providers, you're not delegating actual tokens, you're delegating a detachable vote that is one for one. You get one vote per songbird token is what you're delegating. So you're delegating voting power to these signal providers. And now we're gonna talk about here how there's a cap on the amount of voting power each signal provider could have. It's a 10% cap of the total songbird that are delegated. So no one single provi signal provider can have more than 10%. And now we see here, Patty, that Bifrost has gone over 10%, right? Now, I what think, does this mean? So I actually think they're under it because earlier oh, this morning, it. yeah, earlier this morning, I looked at it. They are at around 140 million rap songbird delegated to them. And there actually was a little tool tip right here with, you know, like a circle and an eye that I hovered over. And it said that, you know, they are over delegated to what will happen in this instance. So let's say if you went and delegated to Bifrost Oracle, since they have the most right now, and they have over 10%. So let's say 15% as an extreme example of the total delegated voting supply. If they're at 15%, basically their voting power will be scaled down to 10%. So now Bifrost can only receive rewards on 10% uh, or rather it'd be two thirds of the total people that delegated to them. And in that regard, that would kind of dilute the rewards because now you're, you know, move like spreading out more rewards around more people, but you're getting less. So I guess think of it this way. I'm going to pull up the whiteboard to make this easier because I'm having a hard time. So if they have 15% voting power delegated to them with a cap of 10%. So the difference between these two is 33%. So that means that they're going to have to spread out rewards over 33% extra because they have so many more people delegated to them when only they can use 10% of the supply. So that kind of limits how many rewards could go to that signal provider for any FTSO closing. And this is a large difference there. So, you know, instead of let's say maybe all 15%, if they were allowed to uh, put that much voting power to the FTSO, uh, you know, you could still earn up to all those. Well, you can only earn 10% of that and you still have to distribute among all of them. So it just kind of dilutes it. However, I will say, you know, somebody that has the voting power that Bifrost Oracle has, they have a greater chance of possibly being in the median 50% with at least some of their voting power. And that's just by nature of having more data points that will go to the FTSO. Uh, so Mickey, on this, we can kind of think like, let's say we have... Uh, an X axis here. And let's say we have like $1 here for one FTSO, then a $2, a $3 and a $4. And if these two, let's say one and $2 has 10 and then let's see 20 and we'll say five and three. So to find this median 50%, we're going to have to truncate the outer 25% of each one. So with that, that would be seven from each side. So that would get rid of all these. They would not get rewards if this was your input. Also, this would cut out four of these as well. So this would turn into just one vote that's going to be used. All 10 of these votes would be used since they're going to be in the median. And then over here, if we take out seven, that leaves you with three. So if we had $2 here and $3 here, we would take a weighted average of these three numbers and that would give us the FTSO output for a given time series. 
And so you can see the larger the votes you have, that means, you know, there's a higher likelihood that you get included in this median median. So like while like it was weighted higher down here with 10, they still had three of their votes get through, even though they were kind of on the outside of the four prices that were put in. But because it had a higher weight, that means that it contributed more to the Oracle output. Now, so also, gonna, yeah. yeah, you're also there's going to be many time series Oracle. So what Patty just described, there's me many time series and the prices are random. So the prices that are chosen. So there's 10 different price feeds in the time series Oracle. Anyone can be chosen at random. And these time series will happen over and over again throughout the whole week. So it's not just like, oh, we're all coming to just one price feed for one asset throughout the whole week. No, there's going to be many of these taking place throughout the whole week. So at some point, there is some randomness involved. But like what Patty said, the ones with the more voting power are more likely to win. But they also then have to distribute to more people. So now since we have two uh, potential delegations, you might want to, and this is not financial advice, it's just educational, that you might want to do delegate one to a higher percentage that has more, like an 8 to 10%. And then maybe you want to try one that has a lower because you might be able to earn more rewards there, but it's maybe a little safer of a bet to go in one with the top. But I would not delegate to one that's over 10%. I mean, it does, you know, you're just going to be sharing rewards with more people. Yep, right, absolutely. Patty? Yes, yeah, so you will. And I mean, the thing is that it just starts getting diluted if the voting power is too high over that 10% cap. So that to me is really the only issue with it, you know, you're not going to lose any of your assets. This is all risk free. So it's not like staking where, you know, you can get kicked out if they're oversubscribed to a particular validator. It doesn't work like that. You'll still be involved. The voting power just gets diluted down to that max cap percentage. Additionally, you know, some of these uh, FTSOs down here that we see, you know, are towards the bottom range with voting power. Maybe they come out and they're the first ones to start lowering fees. So that's another thing that we'll take into account. Uh, and, you know, we'll kind of have to weigh what is their success rate and, with what is their fee rate. And using those two things, we can start to get an idea of maybe who you would want to go with in the future. But, you know, we need to see these success rates coming in. And, you know, soon enough, you know, over the weekend, we'll start seeing what's going on and, you know, start seeing who's going to be the most successful out the gate. You know, I do think I over time, generally, I think a lot of the signal pro providers will probably have similar success rates or at least be in a you know closer range. But I think that's like a long term thing that it takes to play out in the beginning. I imagine there's going to be a lot more variance just because by nature of there being way less time series and FTSO closings that have happened. Um, yeah. And this is a very decentralized system. So the way that you have all these different signal providers and now if you see that it goes over 10%, people are going to be less likely to delegate to them because they're going to want to earn more rewards. So it will naturally just balance out more. So this is getting out the gate in a very decentralized way. This also does not include any of the exchanges and other enterprises that are going to be running signal providers for maybe the market makers for different exchanges. So this is just right now all the non-custodial options. Now, I just want to throw in here before we go in a little further that right now to delegate, you cannot delegate directly from your nano ledgers to the signal providers. You need to, you could go from Decent when they have their app up, but right now, I believe it's just through Bifrost or MetaMask. And then MetaMask, you got to go through FTSO.EU site and AU. connect AU site and connect into there to go delegate to signal providers. Right now, your best bet is to download the Bifrost wallet. It's super easy to use. You wrap your tokens, and we went through this in yesterday's video if you look, if you watch that, and just delegate. It's designed for, it's a Web3 wallet. Now, you need to use a Web3 wallet for this, and not all wallets are Web3. Only Decent, MetaMask, and Bifrost are gonna have these capabilities. And Decent just announced today that they're gonna have support for Songbird, and then they're going to be opening up their delegations. But Bifrost right now is the only one. And if you haven't done it yet and you're getting your tokens next week, that's okay. Then you participate in next week's epoch. So if you haven't got your tokens, probably best bet is to download your Bifrost wallet right now. It's nearly as secure as you're going to have as a hardware wallet. 
And that's not any type of advice, but it's just a fact. You know, the hardware and private keys are locked in your actual secure enclave and your biometrics authenticates everything. You know, and I, I know that sometimes gets a little people, ugh, with nano ledgers, I got to keep everything offline. They're not that much more secure than the software wallets these days with biometrics on. All right. So that'll cover the FTSO stuff for today. And the next part, we just want to address the fact that Bhutan, which is a country in Asia, really small one. I think it's about a 780,000 population. So, I mean, it's like 10 times smaller than my state. But however, <laughs> you know, these are the type of countries that are going to be more willing to start moving forward with this kind of stuff, because I think it's a lot easier to, you know, deal and implement this over a much smaller population, uh, you know, just with way less going on in the country than maybe somewhere like the U.S., where we have so many moving parts in all the different states and things like that. So this will be an interesting test bed that's going on that is actually going to use Ripple CBDC solution with private ledgers. So Mickey, I'll kind of hand it over to you here to explain, you know, what are Ripple's goals um, and just kind of what's the roadmap for these kind of things in the future? Yeah, so this was really exciting to see. So we got the first central bank that is publicly disclosed because we know there's NDAs with other central banks, but there's the first one that's going to be piloting it. And now this is going to be carbon net zero, net negative, I believe it was, which is pretty impressive. This country is sandwiched between China and India, very small country. But one thing at the bottom of that Ripple Insights, they talk about a network of CBDC ledgers. Now, they don't use the term side chains in this, and they don't say XRP yet. But that's okay because the Federated Sidechain Amendment is not yet implemented into the XRP ledgers. So we can't have sidechains officially linked to the ledger until that amendment is passed. Now, they're going to create a network of many different private chains. And eventually, they're going to all overlap with each other. And they're going to have sidechain. They're going to have that Federator sidechain connected to the XRP ledger. So then when that happens, you could easily use XRP to bridge between these. But like I've said in the past, we're not going to have a flick of a switch. XRP is going to go up and use CBDCs in the whole world. I personally think for, we're in the pilot phases right now with CBDCs. And this is going to go on for the next few years. So accept that. And we're still piloting. And as Ripple's showing their technology is proven, they build more and more. They also said this is going to be used for retail CBDCs. You don't need XRP necessarily for that. But the goal here for Ripple is to build a bunch of private chains and then connect them as side chains to the XRP ledger and integrate them with RippleNet. So it's a one step at a time. And then as they get more central banks on board with these private CBDC ledgers, they could start doing like Bob Way said, atomic settlement between two central banks and it's game over. And they could prove that XRP right through the middle, they could keep their own currency in their own corridor, their own country, and they don't need to hold other countries' CBDCs. And we're going to see a lot of different pilots from the, from the um, Bank of International Settlements, the IMF. They're all going to try different methods and ways. But in the end, and we're still a few years away before any of these CBDCs, the big ones, really roll out in force. So anyone who tells you we're having CBDCs this year, next year, you know, it's just not, it's just not going to happen. We're not there yet. But this is the steps, and I think Ripple's progressing in the right direction. And they have NDAs with other central banks. So I think this was one of the smaller ones to get it going. And the ledger itself still needs certain upgrades. They're upgrading it with NFTs and the amendments, federated sidechains, and then hooks. So as the XRP ledger gets upgraded in other ways just by its governance and its you know, decentralization governance, it's not Ripple who decides, hey, we want to add federated sidechains. No. The validators have to add those. So Ripple X is the one who has built these uh, CBDC ledgers. It's not Ripple Net. R Ripple X does all the CBDC stuff and all the XRP ledger integrations. So keep that in mind that Ripple has split into two divisions now. And this is the Ripple X division building all of this stuff. And it's a special chain to handle basically the CBDCs. None of these public blockchains, not Stellar, not Hedera, none of them are going to be able to do 
actual CBDCs on the layer one public chains. It's just not feasible. Any of them, Solana, none of them are going to be able to handle it. They need to go into layer twos and side chains and private ledgers and then link back to the network. Stellar, none of these blockchains have scalability to be able to do that and can have the privacy. So you need these private blockchains. And then at some point, they'll utilize XRP. But it's not going to be like, oh, my God, they didn't say XRP. Oh, they're not using it. Well, we've got to get past that now. If you've been in the space since 2018, you should not be making that comment anymore. Not to be rude, but it's like we're <laughs> past that now. All right? Like, you know, they're going to build private ledgers. And then, like David Schwartz says, you're going to pull the gates down, and then they'll utilize the best solution. But we're just at the beginning innings here of CBDCs. And, you know, we shouldn't be thinking, oh, they're all going to ramp up in a matter of a, a year. It's not happening. They're working on all different pilots, and I think Ripple's going in the right direction right now. But I do agree that Consensus and JP Morgan are probably the direct competitors to Ripple right now. And if you look at everything that DAI and Charles Gasparino have been pulling out with the case, you kind of see why they, you know, Consensus is trying to build CBDCs too. So you know, they are competitors in many different ways here. So it's interesting with all that information that's taken place, Patty, um, what's, getting, what's, what's coming up recently. I mean, yeah, so I saw that Jungle Inc. retweeted or tweeted out a post from, I want to say it's Gateway Pundit. I can't remember the yes, exact name. Yeah. I think so. And so they pulled up a video from 2018. It seemed like maybe in September, or October of 2018. So I believe that's shortly after the Hinman speech. And it was this guy that works for Perkins Coy and basically talking about this working group that was working with the sec on trying to make some frameworks and decide which you know assets which blockchains can move forward and which ones are going to be held back uh, obviously we know they went ahead and kind of gave bitcoin and ether the green light but stopped short at number three with xrp and so you know they had a video and this guy is sitting there saying you know they're talking to the sec and he goes you know, none of these tokens out here, like none of them are securities. They shouldn't be thought of as securities. Uh, what you should be thinking about is how are they packaged and sold in certain instances. Yet we see Jay Clayton and the SEC drop a lawsuit that says XRP basically is inherently a security from the past and forever in the future, which is the biggest issue with this entire lawsuit that's going on. Um and yeah, it's it's pretty great that we're just seeing this continually get more and more press with the media, especially mainstream media. Fox Business is covering it now. You know, it's amazing. I, I don't understand why more aren't covering it, especially since, you know, it's something at this point that's crossing two different, you know, sides of the political aisle as far as administrations. And they're both, you know, going with it, which is amazing to me. You know, maybe I'd hope that they'd say, oh, you know, Jay Clayton did this under the Trump administration, so let's make him look bad. But really, it's just been lockstep. The SEC, Gary Gensler comes in, and honestly, I could argue he's just as bad as Jay Clayton. I mean, he hasn't done something that directly affects me as much, but he's affecting other people in the industry, and I'm sure he's going to keep doing things that will. Uh, so, you know, I, th I just think it's good that people are seeing they had this working group. Uh, who were these people tied in with? How did they make these decisions? Why did they make those decisions? All that stuff is super important. Absolutely. And how can you and that guy in that video and even in the judge from the Telegram case said there's no way that these actual tokens can be securities themselves that are trading out there. It's impossible. And the SEC had the audacity to put that into the lawsuit to say this thing's a security. So it's not a security of Ripple. It's not a stock. It could have been packaged as, but they like went to the next step and put that in there, which was just like, you know, it baffles all of us because there's no way something could be a security that's trading out there on a decentralized ledger. Even Telegram, they said the token's on security and the network wasn't even really built yet. So, you know, the SEC is really stretching, stretching the broad scope of this securities law and then, you know what this ripple case is heading in the right direction i really hope it goes to summary judgment i hope we do not settle now because we need full clarity on xrp here and i it's also ironic that the sec during the case pulled back and said no nope, we never said ethereum was not a security so wouldn't it be funny that at the end of all this 
XRP is undoubtedly not a security. The XRP Ripple holds is not a security, but ETH now has this unknown about it because the SEC said when it, we didn't say it's not a security. So things can change very quickly. And I got a shout out, DAI is doing a great job digging all this up. And Jungle, great job on posting that video. That was excellent. It really showed that Ethereum had this like in with just the SEC. And Larson has said, we're great with the Treasury, with the Fed, with CFTC, with FinCEN, but everyone seems to have a problem with the SEC except the Ethereum Alliance and Consensus. They seem to get the red carpet rolled out for them and only them. I mean, you, there's nobody really with Bitcoin, so I like they could roll out the red carpet for Satoshi. <laughs> but Ethereum got the red carpet. They got a couple big law firms, a couple big VCs, and they hammered it down and just gave basically, they wrote the speech for Hinman. So we, we got some leaked documents that show that other people were involved. Now, Ripple probably even knows other in other um, documents that we don't know, and that's why they asked for those for in-camera review. So we're getting close to the end here, but personally, I want to see a summary judgment with a win. And I want to see Brad and Chris's thrown out, and I want to see summary judgment that XRP is not a security, and then to also win with summary judgment that those were not investment contracts, and then XRP could be used as a currency slash commodity, just not a security. Because Ripple's lending out XRP. They want to do things with XRP. They want to be a market maker for that. They can't be registered with the SEC and calling this thing a digital security and be able to do those things. This is why they're not going to just take the slap on the wrist and register with the SEC, in my opinion, because it hinders their business so much to do that. And when you're winning, you don't just give in that. You go for the kill. And I think this is where they're heading right now is going for the all out win. And, you know, I don't see this thing dragging out that much longer. But in realistic you know, opinion, I'm expecting another couple months to the end of the year, not get my hopes up. And, you know, we have other things going on right now. We got Songbird launching, which is huge. This is one of the most cutting edge blockchains ever built in all of crypto right now. This whole delegating process is brand new. It's no risk to delegate your tokens. It, uh, there's no risk. You're not even giving up your tokens, actually. You're delegating votes. This is safer than staking. It's more secure than staking. The rewards will probably be even higher than staking on Flare. Oh, that's the other thing to bring up, Patty. I want everyone to know that when you do see rewards for Songbird coming in this next week, they're going to be probably seven to eight times higher on Flare Network, just because the inflation rate is based on that $100 billion instead of just this you know, $15 billion. And the circulating supply really right now is not 15 billion. I keep hearing people say that. It's not 15 billion. What was it, Patty? It's 9.6, mm -hmm. I think, or 9.6. Something like that, yeah. And now we're waiting on a blog or something to come out from Flare team to give us a little more details on this. And once that happens, we'll put out some tutorials and stuff. But we don't want to put out tutorials too early before having all the information. I know many of you in the comments you know, ask for the tutorials, and we want to do those, but we want to do them with the most accurate information possible before we do that. Patty's put out some, if you haven't seen, connecting your Ledger to MetaMask, because Ledger didn't build an app for you. Toa Labs built one, and they're waiting for Ledger approval. So you can't just send your tokens from Ledger right now to buy first. You've got to connect it through MetaMask to do that, all right? But if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you could just wait. The app's going to come out soon. And then you'll be able to send your tokens to Bifrost. But I think I encourage everyone, Decent and Bifrost are the ideally suited wallets. And they're both very secure. Can They're not like hot wallets where somebody could steal your private keys from there. They're locked inside your secure enclave. And there's no way to really access them. As long as you keep biometrics on, you want to keep that on. Because then anything that's authorized has to go through your biometrics. And that's very important. So you could feel comfortable and safe using these wallets they're nearly as secure as hardware wallets awesome well uh any other last thoughts mickey or we'll call i this guess one. the last thoughts is i'm just excited that we're able to earn rewards and unfortunately you know i understand that there's some frustration to those who held on exchanges and you weren't able to participate this epoch i i hurl i held a uh, small percentage on on bitstamp too and i am i am not able to utilize those yet and that's unfortunate but you know what next week we start 
So you want to be able to do that next week before Thursday. So I think this is a very exciting time and you should be able to see that the market is changing. The industry is changing. And we're getting to a point now where you're a participant in the network. All governance decisions are through liquid democracy. And yes, you can have decentralization and have governance. And I've heard some people say you can't have both. You absolutely can have both. And Flair has built in liquid democracy with decentralization. It's not a matter of one or the other. You can have both, and Flair has that. And I think that's powerful that all of us, when you get your songbird, you're a governor in the network and you're a participant in the network. Are you going to take advantage of that? And you gotta remember, these aren't stocks that you just hold. They're assets to be utilized in community-driven public blockchains. There's nothing Gensler can do about that. Yeah, and also, Mickey, just kind of of note that you're only hurting yourself if you know, you're not utilizing your songbird to participate in the FTSO. I mean, in the future, when there's more stuff out and maybe there's another opportunity you can use with it, totally understand going there. But right now, all you're doing, if you're not participating, is you're diluting your current purchasing power. So the longer you wait to get in and earn some of the inflation coming into the system, the more your purchasing power is going to get diluted over time in regards to the Songbird token, because you're going to have somebody right next to you that's earning more on a daily basis, and there's going to be a higher supply. So that means your share of the total supply will decrease over time unless you earn some of this inflation. So you know, right now, think about in the US, around the world, they're inflating all of the sovereign fiat money, you know, just at crazy numbers right now. Does that inflation go to any of us? Not really. We got a couple stimulus checks. You know, most of it is going to the big boys or to deal with, you know, all the, the equity markets or swaps and bank lending and all that stuff. This is your opportunity to actually earn inflation from an economic system rather than, you know, just being in the traditional fiat monetary system where, you know, it's just everything around you, your your wages don't go up, you know, you don't get any in the inflation and you're just getting your purchasing power diluted every single day. Can't even put it in a 5% savings account to keep up with it. That's how high it is. It's like, this is your opportunity here in, you know, decentralized blockchain, all that, this whole space where you can earn inflation. And that's not something that can happen in, you know, our current system we have in the world. So I just want to stress that part. No, that's a great point you bring up there because if you, if anyone just before we wrap this up, you've looked at coin market cap and you've seen tokens move up, but their price necessarily hasn't jumped so high. And you wonder why is that? Well, that's because the inflation rate on those tokens, it's not getting dumped on the market. It's going to people who participate. And this throws people's TA all out of whack because these tokens are gaining market cap value higher and people are building wealth with them, but the value of their assets isn't necessarily skyrocketing. So you shouldn't always pay attention to just the price of these assets. People are gaining wealth by earning network rewards. And that might necessarily raise the price, but people are gaining value and wealth. And then at some point when they do capital appreciate, you get even more wealth. So I think it's time for us to realize that it's not just about staring at fiat leak and staring about the prices just going up because you could gain value in network rewards. Network rewards are not DeFi. So delegating to a signal provider, that's not DeFi, just so everyone knows. Staking is not DeFi. That's just earning the network. And like Patty said, inflation. You're a participant, you earn the inflation. The guy sitting there on the sideline who's too afraid to do anything, he doesn't earn the inflation. So this is that transferring of value to the hands of people who participate. And that's going to give them more voting power in the long run to vote on things of the network. So the person on Twitter that just likes to have a loud voice and make random comments, he'll have no voting power. And the people who have accumulated this, the Songbird and Spark tokens, they'll be the one who will influence the network. They'll be the ones who say, hey, we want to add this asset next too. To, to F assets and stuff. And Flare Finance is going to have their own governance too. So we have to realize this is your chance to be a participant in it. And it doesn't even come with risk. You know, DeFi, that comes with a little more risk. But network rewards here, very little risk. There's no reason why you can't just delegate right now. You don't even have to do just a small amount. I mean, there's no risk in doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, 
this is like the base level of participation. If you're going to be a songbird token holder or a spark token holder that I am imploring you to, you know, take advantage of. And also it's huge for the system. Like it's extremely helpful. It's possible flare and songbird with this, you know, the FTSO could create one of the best Oracle products out there. Um, I mean, we all know about the Oracle problem and normally the native tokens being able, you know, being used to secure the network in the consensus. This is like the first time that for an entire blockchain, it's being used for the Oracle and the Oracle problem is a big deal. A lot of these DeFi hacks that happen, you know, they happen because people can attack the Oracle because they're not decentralized enough. And if the Oracle for these networks is not decentralized enough, they're never going to realize their full potential. So, I mean, this is like a pretty new thing. I don't know. I don't even know if there's any other blockchains that the layer one, you know, comes with an Oracle basically built in almost. So, you know, you don't have to do any of the other DeFi stuff that we talk about. Like, I understand if that's over your head, but this is something like I literally talked to my dad on the phone last night and explained to him how to delegate and wrap. He was able to do it and he's never sent a crypto from one place to another in his entire life. So like it's it's really not that hard. And all the people that have given me feedback, especially through Bifrost Wallet, you know, they've said they were so happy with how easy it was. Like it's 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 so intuitive that you could probably do it if you had no idea how to do it before without seeing a video or a guide or anything. So it's really it's really not that hard. And, you know, look into it a little more before you do it if you're not sure what's going on. Or, you know, leave a comment down here if you have questions. But this is like just a baseline participation. And, you know, you don't have to do anything beyond that. There's a lot more complicated stuff that you can get into. But you're not losing custody of your tokens when you do this. And that's so important. Yep, well said. And the last thing I'm going to leave off with is there's no like set APY. And when it comes to the rewards that you can earn, we don't have all the answers on exactly how you're going to earn the most and how to do it. It's an learning process over the next few weeks and as we become more familiar on how to strategize for you you know then you could strategize as the more details come out if you really want to discuss strategizing more and how to maximize your ability to take advantage of the songbird network and the x5 platform and DeFi in general you could join our patreon group we have zoom calls every wednesday and sunday they're like two hours long and we do M&A the whole time. We walk people through it. And it's extremely helpful if you really want to level up your knowledge to be at the forefront of this and take advantage and build generational wealth. Because in my opinion, it's not going to come from just sitting there and waiting for moon. That will help. But building and establishing these revenue streams are important. You could, you could establish 15 to 20 different revenue streams when Flare goes live. But you need to know how to do that. So it does take a little effort to learn, and it's not going to come to everyone right away. But if you want more information than we put out on YouTube, on Twitter, our Patreon, we have a full Discord, a Telegram group, and an announcement channel. So check out our Patreon group. It's on the link below. And I'm Mickey B. Fresh. Patty XRP. And we, and we are out. Nice.